the hot gun is amazing. You know why? Because it gives everybody at least once a year a taste of Talmud. There are many Jews, especially those, let's say, women. A lot of women don't study Talmud. Jews, Jews know about Torah. There's a lot of Jews who are unaffiliated, unfortunately. There's a lot of kids. There's a lot of people who just, maybe they, they were in yeshiva when they were younger, but they're not connected to Talmud anymore, so they never get to hear any Talmud. But the Haggadah is basically a Talmudic work. And it has, it has teachings from the Talmud in there that you're supposed to discuss, and even has Talmudic give and take in there. So at least once a year, everybody has to sit down and study Talmud together. That's the whole point of the Haggadah, isn't it? To ask questions at the beginning. So that's why the Haggadah, that, that's just one factor that makes the Haggadah so, so wonderful. Another thing is that you can mine it for all sorts of different tour. I think anybody worth his salt has put out his own Haggadah. Uh, one of my, my mentor back in the United States, he put out his Am Hanifchar, the Chosen People Haggadah. And most are, you know, they use the, the classical old school Haggadah that we used to use when we didn't have Korban Pesach. They use that as the base. But everybody who's anybody puts out his Haggadah with his own thoughts and all that, right? Right. Yeah. So, and some of us don't do that. Some of us just decide to change the whole Haggadah entirely, you know? And then we're thinking about a second edition because the, the Nusach, as it was, or as it is, is not good enough for some people, right? They keep messing with the Nusach. And like last week, we saw, oh, there's all these new insights into the Haggadah. Keep, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So one of the things I saw in the Haggadah is the idea of matzah, what it represents. And you know that there's two, two paragraphs in the Haggadah that actually talk about what is matzah about. Rav Gamliel says, matzah, zusha, no achim. What's it about? What is matzah about? Come on, someone, someone's been through Pesach before. What's matzah represent according to Rav Gamliel? He's at the very end of Magid. What? Rav Gamliel says you have to mention three things or you haven't fulfilled your obligation on Passover. The three things are Pesach, matzah, and more. Pesach, al shuma. Pesach is what they used to eat in, in Egypt, you know, when God passed over, so to speak, the houses of the Israelites and, and uh, didn't kill them, instead killed the Egyptian firstborn. Okay, matzah. What we eat, it's what does that have to do with it? Right? Because they, uh, the Israelites were in a rush to leave Egypt, and they didn't have time to bake uh, to let the dough rise, so they baked it quickly. They grabbed the kneading troughs and just took the dough, and they baked it quickly before it, it, it rose to proper bread, and that's why they had matzah. That's what they took with them, right? That's right. That's in the story of the Exodus. And then there's more. But if you look closely in the Torah, it's kind of strange. You know why? Because it does say that. It mentions the dough twice as they're leaving. It says they took the dough with them. And then it says that they, they baked it. That dough is over keeping track of it. But even earlier before the Exodus, what do we find? Quite a few days before the Exodus, apparently 14 days before the Exodus, the Israelites are told, by the way, go bake yourself some matzah to eat with the Korban Pesach. Al matzot umro rim yochiluhu. That is, they're told to get these lambs and, sac- and slaughter them, sacrifice them, whatever. They couldn't really make it into a sacrifice. There is no altar. Whatever, prepare these lambs for sacred uh, consumption and eat eat it with uh, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So they already had a supply of matzah on hand even before the Exodus. They, were, they had to bake this matzah beforehand in order to be ready for the meal. And then, incidentally, they suddenly had to make a lot more matzah. It sort of foreshadowed they're eating this matzah, foreshadowed what was about to happen. So too, eating this thing called the Pesach foreshadowed that God would, that night, as they were eating the Pesach, pass over their houses, so to speak. And that's why the Haggadah actually starts off with matzah as the beginning. What, how, does it, how does the actual Magid start? Balach ma'anya. This is the bread of affliction that they used to eat. So there's two, there's two matzahs in the Bible. There's the matzah that they ate just because they had to eat with Korban Pesach. And then there's the matzah that they ate because they spontaneously had to make, had to make matzah. So too, the Haggadah mentions two types of matzah. The matzah you start with that you break. It's lechem oni. This represents the, the, the poverty and the affliction of our ancestors in Egypt. But by the end, we get to Ramah Gamliel's matzah. So you have two types there. And now I'm discerning it, all these things I was reading about and people arguing about Tisha B'Av. We're gonna give, we're gonna, I'm going to ask everybody to give me what he thinks is the answer to this question. I'll tell you why I realized I couldn't give a straight answer. And I came up, I, I thought I came up with two legitimate answers that represent two different approaches entirely. What is Tisha B'Av all about? Why Tisha B'Av? What are we sad about? What's the lesson? I don't know. Well, I, I, I was at the temple. I saw the temple in ruins and I saw the bad guys lording over us there. You know, it was, it was pretty sad. It's a pretty sad state, despite the, the progress we've made just in the last decade. But the Khurban is still alive and well, as they say in Yiddish. So uh, go first. What does Tisha B'Av mean to you? Try to keep it quickly, you know, because uh, I like talking. Very 
right. Um, okay. Uh, something along the lines of how at the end of the day, it comes down to us. It's like, no matter what bad things happen to us, it's still sort of an us problem that we can't go back to what should have been. Mm -hmm. We can't get our act together. Our fault, yeah. We don't I, learn from it. I agree with that. It's not God's fault. God, God gave us everything. It's like we, we were the ones who didn't listen. Harry Jeremiah. Yeah, Josh? Um, it's, it's, it has changed it each year, but mm. this year, I like what Rabbi Wedgeper said. And he mentioned the Divan Thumb and how he, and how he described it as a, a day of, um, of, of Timama and, and silence. Mama silence. You guys got that? Dima is, is tears. The mama like Vaidoma Aron. Dalad Vav Mem Mem Hey. Silence and accept. Okay? That's what that's one approach to mourning. So the mourning aspect. You're talking about the, the accountability aspect. And you bring in the mourning. Robert, you feel you want to say anything yet or, or, or pass? It's about not being complete. Not being who? Not being who's not complete. It's about not having everything you need in order to live out your existence of this one properly. And just like a human being needs food and water to do the things that they most properly are designed to do, the Jews need, need a temple in order to do the Okay. So you, we got accountability, mourning. Uh, what do you say? Not complete. What is it? Um, lack. lack. Okay. Rambam has a lot about that in his uh, in his uh, interpretation interpretation of Eov. Yeah, I forget what's what's the fancy word they use for lack. It's uh, He's missing something. He's so robot. I'm saying in English, and that, even that he doesn't use that word because he wrote it in Arabic. Different translations have. By the way, uh, if you lack water, uh, you find some cups. I think there are cups in the closet there. I got so I filled some water here. The kitchenette has water in other cups. So feel free to drink anything. You know, you shouldn't make yourself starving. Want to offer something? An answer? Or pass? Um, I think that's the last prayer and worship for all nations. Mm -hmm. So I think like today, what a lot of people overlook is that it's like a commemoration of our neglect of responsibility to the world. And so just like we have to communally serve the world in this house of prayer and worship for all nations. So if there were communally mourning that we can't provide that for the nation. Okay. It's, it's really our responsibility to do that. The world's going to stay in the state that it's in until um, I, I feel like there's more education to the Goyim. You know, like, for example, like Iran needs to understand that this structure, this building is a benefit for them. Okay. Yeah. If the Gentiles only knew how much the temple benefited them, they would have right. fortified it. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I was thinking about what you said. I used to think that way. I remember speaking in yeshiva a few years ago. I said, when I was a student, it's interesting. The, the, the Jews are the Kohanim for the rest of the world. Yet, this whole Messianic era, that's, that's on our, that's on us. The Gentiles barely understand what it means, uh, you know, a true Messianic era, but it's our responsibility to bring it about, which is kind of a, kind of scary when you think about it. They could say, hey, what's with you Jewish people? You haven't lived up to what God wanted. You're holding us back historically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah, they don't understand the loss, and if they, if they knew, they would have fortified it. Now, the Gemara says that. Built fortifications around it. But you want to offer something you're on your own sure, that you're talking? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ungratefulness. I like that one. I don't know that I have uh, that answer. But, uh, okay. I just want to mention like two earlier Tishabobs. Yes. That, you know, aren't the destruction of the temple. Um, there's um, uh, choosing not to enter the land, saying we need more time 
you know, if we need we need more time in, in exile in the desert, we'll we'll grow and then we'll, yeah. and then we'll earn it. Yeah. Um, and the other, I don't remember where I heard that this was uh, on Tishabov. It may have been Yaakov Shimoni, but I don't remember, I don't know exactly. Okay. Okay. But um, uh, Yaakov's uh, wrestling with uh, with the angel. Yes. Was supposedly on Tishabov. So. I can't tell you. I don't remember exactly. Okay. Good to think about those two as well. It's not just the temple. There's other aspects of the day. There's other aspects. Okay. And uh, last but not least. Yeah. Um, I remember from a podcast with uh, podcast. Be Connected for Real. Uh, I don't listen to those. <laughs> oh, you? Oh, I, ha- really? I have to listen to them as they're being recorded, so I don't like upload them to my phone or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's connected for real. It has been said that there's Aren't this for women though? Things. Aren't collecting for real for married women in business? You don't well, really fit that demographic. I up Rabbi Avi Grossman and it came up as the first option. So naturally I had to listen to the podcast. I think I think because the producer of those podcasts gets about ten times as many views as I do of anything I do. You know, a whole order of magnitude more, so I would understand why the search engine would find that first, okay? I'm basically well, piggybacking. Anyway, it, yeah. was, it was said that there's, it's distinctly related. There's, mm-hmm. there's belief in God, which is like the intellectual, yes. and, uh, which is a lot easier to do. And so you have trouble with that, but uh, there's belief in God, and then there's trust. And with trust, it's like, for sure, most people uh, don't do it. This is what the Milagro line, Milagro line. Uh, are like the seven most you should have that. And everything else is just a follow-up of that. And it's that they totally lack trust. Okay. I like what you're saying. And I like what you're saying too. So now I'll tell you what I realized. I saw there's one fellow likes to get into arguments with what he thinks are the Haredim, which is silly because Haredi is very uh, bad label. It doesn't represent so many things. But there has been a lot of, let's say, from American media, from American media here talking about this lack of connection, being distant from God. And he was trying to emphasize, I think this was a Slifkin, who's not right about everything, but thinks he is. And uh, he was writing that they're missing the Isaiah aspect. What's the Isaiah aspect? Shabbat Chazon, the first chapter of Isaiah, he's decrying the injustice, corruption of basically the ruling class. He says that is what Tisha B'Av is all about. And while he is correct that in his reading of Isaiah, Isaiah himself when he said this, when did he say it, by the way? It apparently was in the times leading up to the birth of Chizkiyo Amalekh, was not speaking about Tisha B'av per se. He is talking about averting a catastrophe. He's talking about the Jerusalem of the mid-7th, uh, negative 8th century, I think, thereabouts, whatever it was when he was alive, and talking about corruption of the ruling class that is leading to the threat that the nation... The, the country will be overtaken by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. That is what he was talking about at the time. So it's true that we read about this in the days leading up to Tisha B'Av, and it is true that what Isaiah said was as true then as it is today. And there are a lot of lessons he points out real, but that not, that's not necessarily Tisha B'Av. And not only that, the Torah itself does not connect the Meraglim, whatever that means, by the way, and Shmuel is right about this one, Whatever the Meraglim problem was, is not directly connected in the Psukim to Tisha B'Av. Yes, we have a tradition that what happened with the Meraglim was on Tisha B'Av. What happened on Tisha B'Av is, and still is, the destruction of the, te- of the Temple. So when we look at Tisha B'Av, we actually look at something like we look at Matzah. There is a lot that goes into it. The fact that we are sitting down in mourning and that were said about it, let's say the morning aspect, the the, the the acceptance of what it was, that is very much in our observance of Tisha B'Av as in the commandments of the day. No eating, no drinking, not even wearing shoes, that whole sitting on the floor thing, etc. That is straight destruction of the temple and all the other terrible things that happened. And midrashically, we connect Tisha B'Av, we say its roots are in the Meraglim. And like we said on Shabbos, it must be that the temple being destroyed, etc. all those things that Chazal connected. Remember Chazal bringing in the Mishnah, all these bad things that happened on Tisha B'Av, and then they, they come up with all sorts of Eshat Torah sounding things about how later events happened, World War I apparently, even though World War I 
yeah, it did break out around Tisha B'Av's time, but there are things that are leading up to it and other, other such events in history, they connect to Tisha B'Av. That's all very well and good. But those are all symptoms of an underlying problem. And that underlying problem is exactly what you mentioned about the Muraglim, that they could not handle what they're being told. And what were they being told? They're being given everything on a silver platter and being told you just have to do what God says. And you know what the problem was? They did not. The choice was, we can't do this. We can't do this. They said it out loud. Basically, God told them, you know, uh, you, wanna, you want galut? So you will get galut. Or as uh, they say, jokingly says, uh, it, smile and the world smiles with you. Cry and I'll give you something to cry about, you little monster. So that's how it goes. You know, that's what God basically said to us, so to speak. And we relate to God, by the way. It's easy for us to understand him as, uh, let's say, a father father figure so fathers have to reprimand their children they have to teach them the right way and also be very a little bit disciplinarian otherwise they're not doing their jobs as fathers so to god we have to conceive of him as a father figure we're told to do that that'll help us understand how to behave and sometimes not only is the god's answer to the prayers and the requests no sometimes it's a very stern rebuke because he's been training us for something and we've been basically saying no to that so I see that Tisha B'Av has all these factors coming to play. There's the underlying cause, that's the Muraglim. And then there's all these symptoms, that's the destruction of the temple, etc. And then there's the societal problems that we face. The problem with the Muraglim was that it was something that everybody basically said out loud. Everybody was thinking that. The majority of the people were thinking that, as represented by you know, 10 out of 12 major leaders. If you want to know the, the caliber of the Muraglim, just look at the two who we know about. Yoshua was the grandson of the leader of the tribe of Ephraim and successor to Moses. And Kalev was Kalev, also the next leader of Shevet Yudah. So you can imagine that the other 10 were pretty holding before they were, you know, taken out by God. This is a problem. And even if we could, let's say, fix all the Isaiah-like problems that he decries, which, by the way, are usually talking about the people who have the power to do something. And it's not, a, by the way, it's not a leftist screed. It's not a cry for socialism because... There's, you know, that's not what he's saying. He's not asking government to intervene. He's telling people to be more moral and look out for people. Uh, but we have to actually focus on knowing what God is giving us. And that brings us to the Temple Mount issues because we're here to study things related to the Temple. So take take a book. We're going to open up Sefer Avodah. We're going to continue where we were in Hilchot uh, Beira Bechira. If there's more copies around the base Medrash, even on the bookshelf. So here, here here's my smaller copy. Say once. I'll just leave it. I'll, I'll sweep it up afterwards. Just color dissolve. Yeah, the, the kids brought their art projects here, and then they left them. Here, here, give it to someone else. You know, just try to keep them clean, okay? Uh, yeah, well, one of the things we, we have to keep in mind is uh, God is giving us all these things, and we can't take it for granted. Um, let's talk about, also about censorship, because we were talking about that beforehand. One of the goals that we have here and I think maybe I, I picked this up from the Rav, is let's say there was uh, some other Rav who were, was saying teachings of which we don't agree. You can imagine Rabbi Barchim has a lot that he disagrees with, correct? Would he say censor it? I know that, for example, he got into a lot of arguments with Rav Aviner, especially around the Hitnat Kut time. But also he used to visit Rav Aviner and try to dis, you know, dispute these things with him, argue with him, convince him of these things. And that, I think, was quite civil and also admirable. And you should try to copy that. If there was, let's say, someone who, I don't know, an idea that Rabbi Barkin wouldn't, wouldn't hold of. Think of something. I don't know. I, I, I also disagree with some things. There was someone who I disagreed with very vehemently uh, recently. So what I do, I present what he said. And I say, and here's why I disagree. And not only that, not only should he, should, should, do I disagree with him, I'm trying to convince him of why he is mistaken and why I'm correct. At least the, the position I'm trying to be correct. And we try to bring proof to what we say. We wouldn't say anything here that we can't find a verse in the Torah. Perhaps Rashi says it. We want Rambam to say it. If Rashi and Rambam say that that's what the Torah means, that's pretty good. If we could find it explicitly in, one of the, in, in the Talmud, that would be pretty good. What we cannot fall down to, we can't go to this level is, like uh, described earlier before we were on camera, was censorship. Oh, someone's saying something, let's just hide that, make it go away. If you disagree with something, explain why you disagree with it, especially if that something is 
ostensibly based on the Torah and the Torah Shabbat Peh. It's very important that we come to these things. I think it's very important to argue with this. You know why? Because a hundred years ago, what was the movement in Am Yisrael? What was the critical parasha that also had its, I guess it was being, it was being presented as almost a halach issue in certain quarters. What was the issue back then? A hundred years ago. A hundred years ago in the Jewish world. Zionism. I don't even like that. Zionism is like a political term. If you're just talking about settling the land of Israel, now it's a much more classical idea. Should the Jews, uh, as, a, as a group, try to resettle the land of Israel? And when you frame it like that, by the way, yes, there are people who call themselves Zionists and pe- people who do not believe in the Torah or God, for that matter, were the greatest uh, espousers of such an idea. It gets a little bit complicated. You know why? Because we read this week's parasha like the rest of Am Yisrael, and we see that, wait a minute, this was the whole thing with the Moraglim. 10 out of 12, 10, 10 out of 12 Moraglim don't want the Jewish people to begin settling the land of Israel, and only two do. So this was the argument back then. What did great rabbis argue, argue for back in the 1920s? No, anybody familiar with what was going on in 1920? Oh, Shmuel, you know. What were they saying? They were saying into the 1930s to stay, stay in Europe, actually. Well, stay, look, Jews lived elsewhere around the world. There were Jews in North Africa, and there were Jews in the Middle East, and other, in Iraq and other places like that. There were Jews in America. But yes, the most vocal Jews, rabbinically, there were Jews who were, let's say, aligned with what was called the religious Zionist movement, which when you think about it is just try to you know, do what the Torah says. But the problem is they got the impetus from these secular Zionists, so it sort of taints what they're trying to say. And then you get anti-Zionism, which, lack, for lack of a better word, is describing the, the idea that you said, stay in Europe, let's say, or stay in America. Don't go along with this. And nowadays, we have the luxury of, uh, the fortune of being born long after the, uh, this whole parasha was you know, not, not a parasha anymore. And we also have seen that it turns out one side was correct and one side was not. And it's pretty clear now that we take it for granted that there is a Jewish state here in Israel. We could just hop on a plane from, you know, us Yanks can just get on a plane and come to Eretz Israel as long as they're not trying to, you know, push us with these lockdowns and things like that. You have to cost But you could get here quite easily, correct? So we've seen that there that was correct. In it. But that, back then, that was what they were arguing against. And I would have said back then, <clears throat> you know what? Let's see what, what the sources have to say. Don't just say, oh, these people are, they're Zionists. They're advocating for moving to the land of Israel. Let's not hear what they have to say. Let's make sure that they, they're not around in town even. That was kind of, we realized that that kind of idea was dangerous. Places where the rabbis were espousing that, what happened? What happened to their followers? They're not here anymore. This is, by the way, the introduction to Aim Hambonim Smecha. You guys have heard about that book? Oh, you, good, I'm glad you said no. Aim Hambonim Smecha was written by a, a Hungarian Rav, a victim of the Holocaust, who was part of those, a lot of the Hungarian and Hasidish-like streams, especially centered around Satmar, were very much against Zionism and moving to the land of Israel. And then the whole Holocaust thing came, and one of these very uh, outspoken and idealistic Rabbanim who would have been against it, basically had a change of heart and realized, oh, we should have been advocating for and actively trying to get all of us to immigrate to Palestine for one purpose, just to save our lives. And two, that was the right thing to do according to the Torah, and we just forgot about it. And like Dr. England says, we got so used to doing this, we even came up with Torah-sounding justifications for the fact that we're going to stay put right here. So nowadays, my feeling is that the parasha has now uh, has been reincarnated, and the argument now is about settling the land of Israel, building more yeshuvim, and at one hand, spreading out, and the other hand, going back to the temple, as we know. So there are many people who are nowadays, you could find this, maybe in your, your institution of higher learning, your, your yeshiva, they're officially against such a thing. Now they can continue being against such a thing. And it could be that there's this Rav who's now putting out pamphlets, and he's trying to give shurim, and he's putting stuff on the internet, class v'shalom, advocating that young men like you go to the temple, visit the temple, learn what to do in the temple, bring your friends along, and they think that's wrong. 
that's fine. Argue against them. But if they tell you, we cannot hear these opinions, you cannot learn the Rambam for crying out loud. What do you get from learning the Rambam, by the way? You're supposed to do it. And that's why they include a letter in these uh, Makbili editions after the whole part where you study these books by the Rambam. And you realize everything he says here is pretty much based on Torah Sheba al -Peh. It's pretty clear what he's bringing. And then there's a letter from the Rambam there in the back. And what does it say? Do you guys remember what it says? He describes his own visit to the Temple Mount and how he got the prayer there. And we also have the Edut, the testimony in writing from his son. Because the Rambam had, had one son, his successor. And the Rambam's son writes about it. Do you remember how you, me, the other guy, and my father of blessed memory all went to visit the temple? So he went there himself also. The Rambam and his son, they, they both write about such a thing. So you realize this thing you're supposed to do. But if we're going to say, you know what, you shouldn't hear from those Rabbanim at all. Lock them out. Censor them. Uh, censor them. Erase them from YouTube. Don't let them come into the yeshiva. You know that there's something they're trying to hide. They already lost the argument by doing that. You know they're wrong. I know people like that who are big censors. They're, they're self-appointed inquisitors. It's a, it's a big problem. They're holding people back. Let people hear the truth. Open up the Rambam. Just a little bit. You could open up Ramban too. He doesn't have a book like this. The Ramban has glosses on the Rambam. But he agrees with the basic ideas, by the way. And Rashi also. I haven't found anything in Rashi or Ramban or the Ibn Ezra. Who other Rishonim do we study? I don't know what Rabbeinu Tom says about these things. Rabbeinu Tom liked to disagree with Rashi here and there, starting on the first page of the Talmud. The tour doesn't say because the tour wrote what the the, the four tourim right? right. Or he really didn't go into these things, so the tour isn't the place to go. The rush himself also. You open up the back of these gemaras if it's talking about things having to do with what what was and what will be when the temple's standing. Sachem is the best one. How there's rush only on select parakim. And therefore, two are only on select parakim of Sachim, for example. Right? Why is that? And also uh, Sukkah. Parts of Sukkah talk about what happened in temple times. A lot of it's about, you know, your Sukkah and your Lulav. That's great. You do that all the time. But what about that which was done in the temple and will be done? They leave it out. Not because they were not interested in studying such things, but because they were, that wasn't the goal of the book they were trying to write. So open this up. We're going to uh, Beit Abichira. I think the sixth parak, do we finish the sixth parak? I think we're going to the seventh. This is an important one. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the fear of the, the temple. I'd like to give a shout out to Yaakov ben Yehuda. Have any of you guys met him? Not related. My pen name is Avram ben Yehuda. He's Yaakov ben Yehuda. The two Yehudas are not the same. Have you, anybody met Yaakov? He was an old time student of Rabbi Bar Chaim, a California native who's been living in Israel for quite a long time. He used to make it to the Shur back when he lived in Jerusalem. I think he lives on the on the coast now. Uh, a very nice fellow, and one, also one of the classic bloggers. When you all were in diapers, there used to be the Jewish blogosphere, the beginning of it. He still has a blog, like I do. And he has uh, some very good ideas. He, he's very down to earth. Uh, is he a little bit of a cynic? I don't think he's so cynical. I think he's sort of optimistic, even though he always points out the things that need to be fixed in society and politics. And he was saying how we cannot let the Temple Mount become like a Disney World. Even though we might be going there, we cannot make it, you know, selfies. Wow, look at this. Uh, we're going to see some halachas right here that this is the fear that they had. The people who want to prohibit ascension of the Temple Mount still have an argument against it. But what's the argument? The argument is, okay, don't stay away. The argument is improve what you're doing. It's like the Medrash says, which was a good, great book, but he threw in some, uh, some footnotes there were sort of anti tzioni What do you say? Eric just feels so holy. And therefore, you shouldn't just go to Eretz Yisrael and make Aliyah. You might not be fit for that. That's not what God is trying to teach you. Eretz Yisrael is holy, and therefore, you should go there and keep yourself to the high standards. Or wearing tefillin all the time. Tefillin are holy. You need to keep a proper mind and, and body, right? In order to wear tefillin. So is the answer, do not wear your tefillin because you're, too, you're, you're not good enough? Or is it, wear tefillin and hold yourself to that high standard? Hold on, someone's trying to get in here. What's the answer? And the third thing you said. Don't speak Hebrew. Hebrew is the holy language. Who are you to speak Hebrew, you manuvel? And the answer is, no. Speak Hebrew and purify yourself and sanctify yourself. Hold yourself to a higher standard by speaking that language. I'll bring you there. Yeah. In terms of unfitting, actually experiencing that 
and the symptoms you were feeling, it makes you do holy to, to you remember, oh, I shouldn't have this, I shouldn't have this thought or, or whatever. And that was the intention all along. Sure. That's what the sages taught us. That's what God intended. And based, by the way, that's all the other mitzvot. The mitzvot are there to improve your character, as the Rambam would say. So keep them. God wants us to be here to keep the mitzvot and speak his holy language. And where is tefillin? And where is tzitzit? So that we remind ourselves all the time. It's reminders. That's basically all it is. It's not to belittle them. A reminder is a very important thing, especially for a human being who's unappreciative and is easily distracted. The first halacha is what Yaakov was talking about. We cannot allow people to desecrate the Temple Mount. We're going to see here some rules that we have, of which we have to remind ourselves all the time. The first one is the mitzvah to say, min ha-mikdash. Fear the Temple. Revere the Temple. Shnemar u-mikdashi tira'u. Pretty simple. And fear my sanctuary. Velo min ha-mikdash atayarei. Elo mimi shetziva al yirato. It's not that you actually have to fear the temple. You have to fear the one who, who, you know, who commanded such. Don't turn the temple into an object of worship, chas v'shalom, like they did in Jeremiah's time. What happened in the times of Yirmiyah and Navi, Jeremiah? There was a group of people who were quite vocal about it, saying, whatever the Babylonians may or may not do, man, they cannot destroy the temple and they can't ultimately hurt us. Why? Because the temple's here. Temple. Mikdash Hashem or Beit Hashem, Beit Hashem. It, it's, it's invincible, and its invincibility extends to us. They also did that with, our, by the way, the Ark of the Covenant twice in history. They started treating it like a talisman, so it was hidden. One time it was taken away from them, and the second time the king decided, we're just going to hide this so that people don't make that mistake and treat it like some sort of, uh, I guess, it is a holy object, but it is not an object that contains any power whatsoever. And if God wants, he could take his wrath out on these things, like he did many times in history. So that's a very important thing. The Azohi Yirato. How do you show reverence for the temple? Everybody have the place here. If you don't, uh, once again, we're in the seventh. Now we're in the second halach of the seventh chapter. He shouldn't be carrying his staff or wearing his shoes. So what does it mean? What's the wrong with wearing shoes, by the way? In the olden days, they didn't really have paved roads all over the place. Wearing your shoes meant that your feet were dirty. Very dirty. So it used to be, what, what, what was the, the protocol in the still places in the East? Definitely take off your shoes when you go inside someplace. You should wash your feet also, right? Nowadays, this has come, become a little bit tricky because on Tisha B'Av, we don't wear shoes, but for a different reason. It's because of the comfort aspect. So this is something that even nowadays the, the Harabite rabbis are discussing. Let's say you're wearing your Crocs or your slippers from your house in Kochav Yaakov and you walked two miles just to get onto the Temple Mount. It won't help you now to wear those things there because that those are your minalim. They have that 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 got dirty. You should be washing your feet. So that's a problem. So there's some who really take off whatever shoes they're wearing. They go barefoot, maybe in socks onto the Temple Mount, or some of us just bring special slippers to wear, but only because they make hazards on the Temple Mount. Really, I tried to do that whole no shoes or anything on the Temple Mount thing, but with Saarenu, uh, there are Ishmaelites there, and they seem to. There, there, there are places that are paved that should be very easy to walk. There shouldn't be any obstructions there, but what do they do? They put gravel there, right? There are certain places you just can't, you can't walk. Or they, or they decide to just spray it down with water. A lot of people wearing Crocs and things like that. And there's a place where they go, the, the, smo- the, the stones are smooth. So what do they do? They just make sure it's wet there. What happens with Crocs and wet? So you slip. Yay. They're trying to do that on purpose. So what are we going to do? We're a little bit stuck. So you should have, at least have clean feet. Try to do something. What's wrong with carrying your staff? Staff meant you were walking, dafka, like on a hike. Um, nowadays, people don't just carry staffs. It's not the thing that they do. The only people who carry staffs are, let's say, old people who need a cane or a walker, things like that. But that's not what they're talking about here. If a person, so let's say, has to show him in a wheelchair, or is old, he has a walker, that presumably would be allowed on the Temple Mount because it's not an act of disrespect. Rabbi Weber told me that it has to do with what will you do in your home? You don't wear certain things in the house out of respect. Nowadays, we've forgotten this, but that's, how, that's the standard. And it says, Oba Afundato. What's Afundato? Oh, you're going to say, what? What do, you, what, do you, what do you say it is? Well, I've seen some in two interpretations that are very important. Uh, it's either a money sack or your shirt. No, so the, the money sack is something else. Raglov about Tsurim, a little bit said, no, that's the money thing. Avakshal Raglov, obviously, is, you know, he should wash his feet because he was walking around in sandals and got really dusty. Afundato uh, could mean one of two things. The Afuda, 
you put a dot in the in the, in the dalad, yeah. But if they say the rock shell that are blown, yeah. Then if we're saying that the his shoes are because yeah dirty, then why is it double? So double because you have to take off your shoes, and if you didn't wear shoes or for whatever reason, you say they're clean. Both have clean feet, and you shouldn't wear shoes. You could have shoes and they're totally clean. Let's say a guy, I don't know, walk, walk, he, he washed his shoes as he was walking on the Temple Mount. Oh, they're clean, you know? Or the other way around. He's, he's barefoot, but he's got really dirty feet. Remember the old days, they have to, people used to get mud on their shoes, right? Not just nowadays, like it's, it's dry season. People came to the Temple all the time, right? It used to be a thing. You got mud on your shoes. How'd you get it off? Nowadays, thank God, every, everywhere we go is paved, basically. We have sidewalks. Used to be they had roads and then they had paths and paths got muddy. So that's what it means here. There's two things. Oh, sorry, I didn't let someone in. The young man's here. Okay. Afundato is kind of funny. That could be that if you're a workman of some sort, let's say you're a blacksmith. What does a blacksmith wear? He lives a work apron, basically your work clothes. Or it could mean just your t-shirt. There's some say this. So that's a problem. You know why? I don't see people wear their work clothes. Thank God. Most people don't work yet, you know. Most people, if they have a job nowadays, it doesn't get them down and dirty that they have to wear the type of clothing to protect their actual clothing. Does anybody here have a job like uh, where they have to wear protective clothing for? No, none, no one does that. It used to be men had men worked the fields. Men were blacksmiths. Men were, I don't know, uh, you're, you're a tanner or something. But even the guy who has the better job than a tanner, he works in spices, he also wears a type of ap apron to protect himself. And it used to be pharmacists wore these things also because they actually work with chemicals. Nowadays in the pharmacy, they just might wear a lab coat because they do, but they don't really need to wear it. Even the doctors don't need to wear lab coats now, right? But this is, this is a very important thing because unfortunately you see pictures of people walking around in t-shirts on Harbias. That is, even if it wasn't the, the interpretation of what this word means here, it's still wrong, okay? Afundato, okay? It is very, it is wrong. And if you go to our bias, dress formally, dress nicely. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wear your Shabbos clothes because I'll never said such a thing, but you should be dressed. You should be wearing your clean clothes. You should be dressed properly, just like for prayer, at least. Okay. You should be do it. You should be like that. And uh, yeah, t-shirts is a problem. Uh, and we said the, the money, the, the money pouch in the, in the olden days, they didn't have wallets that fat that fit into their pockets and was basically hidden. It used to be something else entirely. But by the way, this leads us to that other halacha. Don't be walking around with some sort of satchel. Your backpack, your briefcase, that does not belong on the Temple Mount. You don't walk around in your house like that. You carry water because you need to drink and it's hot. And also, one of the more unfortunate things they don't let Jews would do is the dress like Jews. What's the ultimate thing a Jew could wear? A nice talit. No, talking about garments, let's say. Even on, and Shabbos also. I would love to wear my towels on the Temple Mount if not just because I want to cover my head properly. When I walk around in the sun, especially on, on non-weekdays, that's what I wear. It's a good thing to wear. And uh, I don't have a decent hat. You know, my wife threw away my hat. They wore there. So, uh, yeah, whatever. So it, that would be a good thing. And we're hoping that things can improve. But this is just seeing this. If you see people, what do you do with people wearing, wearing T-shirts on the Temple Mount? I think better, I wouldn't discourage them necessarily, but you have to sort of tell them. We have to do something about this. There's too many pictures about this. And... Uh, or, or women going up there not, not dressed modestly, that is a major problem. This is not something we should take lightly, and perhaps we are responsible for this. So we have to say this out loud. If anybody's listening to me, yes, go visit the temple, but you better, better be doing it right according to Allah. Otherwise, I don't, you don't have my, uh, I'm not telling you to do it. I didn't tell you to do that. And uh, I don't think I found anywhere on the internet where people are discussing these things, so it's important that we discuss them because we're seeing these halachot in order. Questions about that? No? Let's go on to the next halacha. They ain't sorry, what? What do you mean by like you should tell them? What is that? Oh, like, we, we should Jewish room. milk goes up to somebody and say, Are you wearing Oh, don't give them, only people who listen to you. First, you have to be their friend and say, uh, you know, if, if you trust me. The good thing is, is when you have a little bit of authority, you could tell people, I could tell you guys right now, don't go to the Temple Mount just wearing a t shirt. So you'll listen. You know, you know that I have I carry a, a slight bit of authority because you're listening to me to begin with. You're asking me questions. So I'm telling you, please don't do that. And perhaps that would that would work. Going over to some stranger and saying, hey, you shouldn't be wearing a T-shirt on Temple Mount is likely to backfire. And that's always the case with telling other people what to do. Strange, strange animal that God created, man. You know why? Because everybody wants to tell someone else what to do, but no one wants to be told what to do. Isn't that funny? Right? It's true. 
So you have to be very careful with this. But we have to say this out loud. Don't say like, oh, I heard a shear. I saw in the Machon Shilo YouTube thing. Rabbi says, go to the Temple Mount. Yeah, I'm telling you, go to the Temple Mount on condition you are going to be keeping halacha. So learn the halachot. Read this and then act accordingly. He says here, uh, You can't spit anywhere in Harbais. See that? Ela nizdamin lorok mavlio suto. It used to be suto means don't spit into your shirt or something. It used to be they didn't have disposable tissues. So what did they use as tissues? Like uh, my grandfather showed me actual pieces of cloth, handkerchiefs. So use that. That's what Ramam saying. Suto in this case means his handkerchief. Uh, sometimes they call it a bit pachat or something else. The the, the next paragraph has v'lo yaseh harabai derech she kanes bipetach zo ve'itze bifetach she kenegda k'dei lekatzer haderech. Why would anybody ever think about going to our bias as a shortcut? As we saw last week and as we were screaming at the police on Monday, you were there on Monday? No. Okay. Very important. I said this in Hebrew. There's no such thing as har bias being closed. Har bias, its gates were always open to Jewish people, even though they had to be in purity when they went there. It was always open. It was only a more defined area, the Chael and the Azarot, which were closed at night and guarded by the Levian as we shall soon see. But technically speaking, Harabite was always open. There's no such thing as closing Harabite to Jewish people. We saw that uh, last week. That's how the people who were Tamei were able to, by, by I mean Tamei, I mean the Tamei mate. The people had been to Mikvah that they had not purified with Parah Duma. There was a chance every day of the year and a second chance when they start from Pesach in the afternoon that that day they would realize most of the crowd trying to visit the temple today are Tamei mate. And therefore, we're going to go through with the service today in Tum'ah. We're going to raise the black flag or whatever it is, the sign saying, open, and we're in Tuma mode. It means no korban will be eaten today. Yeah, well, you had a question about that? Is it day by day or Avodah by Avodah? So it seems to be day by day. It's like the start of the day of Avodah. But there's a second time. Korban Pesach is what starts after the day's Avodah. And that's when the people actually start showing up. If you want came to do Korban Pesach, you show up in the morning, they tell you, you're supposed to come at 1.30 in the afternoon, not at 9 o'clock in the morning with the Korban Pesach. It, could, it, it totally messes things up. Any other Korban, it's actually a sign of Zrizut. If you had, let's say, a Todat to bring, or just you were offering this lamb as an Ola, and you come relatively early in the day, you have done well, because you have more of a chance the Kohanim will actually get to do what you need to be done. If you show up with your voluntary offering at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's already looking a little bit iffy, because they're supposed to start the Tamid at 3. You know? You're, you're a little bit late. But Korban Pesach is Dafka in the afternoon after the Tamid. So that's when they're expecting people to show up. And don't show up too early. If not, they may just make you wait outside on Harabayit. The whole point is here, this is yet another example, another example in the Halakha, where we see that the Temple Mount, the vast majority of the Temple Mount, what's known as Machane Shechina, the area is mostly to the south of the Temple and also to the north, because that's where most of the space was. To the west, there's barely any room, as you guys know. Those spaces were always open to Jews and were used for many things. Who used to give shear in the shadow of the Temple Mount? Rabbi Gamliel himself, the Zakain, who's mentioned in the Haggadah, Hillel's, great, Hillel's grandson. So he was there. Harabite was a place of, of, of gathering for holy purposes, also for prayer. That's where people went. And of course, if you were Gentile and you came to visit the Temple and bring sacrifice, hold on. If you came to visit the temple also, as a Gentile, that's where you were. That was the area you were restricted to. I'm very sorry for not uh, admitting people uh, fast enough. I'm not staring at the screen the entire time. Uh, we are in Hilchot uh, Beit Bechira, the seventh parak. We're about to read the the, uh, the third halacha. We're, in, at least in this edition, it's right before the third halacha. So you shouldn't use the Harabite as a shortcut. Why? Because the Havamina was people could go into Harabite even at night, technically speaking. And there's no one making sure at, at the gate to Harabite necessarily saying, hey, have you been to Mikvah today? Okay, or are you Azov? Excuse me, lady, are you Anita right now? They didn't do that. They trusted the Jewish people to know. And Gentiles don't have any issues with Tumor Tara. They could technically go into Harabite as long as they're not threatening us. Yeah. That's a Xera on us that we treat them like Zavim. But they don't have to say, oh, I'm Azov. Therefore, and they, they have no way to get out of that. So how would they ever get onto Harabites? Yeah. Remember, Gentiles could go up to the hill. Technically speaking, that, that was a rabbinic enactment. So when there's Avim and we have to treat their, their women like they're Nidot, etc., 
that's talking about how we should behave toward them. But they don't have to have any, you know, they don't have, their women don't have to think they have to go to mikvah or their men have to think that they have to bring some sort of, you know, sacrifice and then dunk in the mayan in order to purify themselves. It will never work, even if they did. Okay. Well, No. Okay, simple answer, no. Something Go. Something Do you have one of those large editions? Look at the very end, the last halacha in that entire book before all the all the the indices, okay, and the appendices. The very last thing that Rambam writes in Sefer Torah wrote. It's yeah. Okay, who's ever going to get it first? Okay, Leon. It's a, it's almost the foot race here. Okay, maybe you could here. Let, let's see it. Give me it over here. I'll read it right there. He says here, Davar Barui Vigalui. Okay, it is clear and revealed. Shatumotva Tarot Gizerata Katuvain. This Tumantara, it is uh, a decree. Okay, a Gzera of the Torah. Veinan Midvarim Shadatos Shiladam Achratotan. There are not any of those things that man can actually discern on his own. If you were sitting here trying to discover the secrets of the universe, you could you could be an Einstein and figure out the you know special relativity and general relativity, and you could be a Newton. You will never come to Tumantara on your own. What does it mean never come to Tumantara? You can't. You'll, you can't figure it out. Form of it, or you won't. Exactly you, won't how the you won't figure it out how it works the, the le legally, it, or as an abstract set of rules. You will not come down to this. According to the Torah, or the, according no the Daat of Adam, using your your, your mind, your intellect. You cannot come to this. It's strictly a construct of the Torah. Those are the chukim, the types of things that God decreed them. Exactly. Yeah, maybe after the fact you could figure them out, but it's not like you're going to be sitting there saying certain things should be tame, certain, certain beats should be tara. A man, all mankind, is supposed to eventually figure out you can't become a 20 year old adult in this world, no matter what culture part of and say, murder is permissible. You have to come to the conclusion that murder is forbidden. Adultery is forbidden. Theft is forbidden. That makes sense. And if you haven't come to that, your culture hasn't come to that, that conclusion, you have a problem. And you will be held accountable for that. But Tumantara doesn't exist. Okay? We read that. Same thing of immersion. How does it help? If you, if you were contaminated, now you immerse yourself completely in water, in a special type of water, and then you come out of it. Now you're now you're pure again. It's not like the the tuma is. He says tito tsua. It's like mud or you know, some excrement that's stuck on a person, and it's removed by bathing. It used to be you got dirty, you scrubbed yourself with some lye and dunked in the river, and then you were clean. That's basically how laundry works. Also nowadays, right? It's not like that. It's not something physical. Elixiratakatuvi is once again it is a decree. God's decree that it be that way. Not only that, it actually depends on your intention. Therefore, the sages said, A person who managed to immerse himself, he wasn't even thinking about it. He didn't do it with the intention of doing it. He happened to have fallen to the river. And it's a kosher mayan for whatever reason. That's a complete alatha. But the point is, he has not actually purified himself. It's all about in here. He says here, kilo So even though all this, this is just legal, abstract legal decrees of the Torah. Does that answer the question, Robert? Yeah, that's what, that's what Maimonides says. So he says here, there's a remez though. The remez is you have to purify your mind. Just like a person prepared his mind for purification, once he goes into the water, he has purified himself. Even though nothing has changed with his physical body. By the way, that's accomplished. Anybody know any women who converted to Judaism? Good. And what was their act of conversion? Aside from accepting the Torah and the mitzvahs, they went into the water and they came back out. Different person altogether. Isn't that amazing? It changes the person. It's all about what's inside. He's the same exact body was here. Nothing's changed. That's 
that's a person who wants to purify himself from the tuma that affects the souls. That is the, the essence of a person. Those are the thoughts of iniquity and bad characteristics. What the Rama calls deot, by the way, in you know, deot is what they call in uh, modern American English, midos. Good midos is uh, basically what Rambam's talking about in Chot Deot. So that is, uh, it's, it's fortunate that it's an easy place to remember this idea. Tuma is basically abstract. So by, so by abstract, does it mean like material reality or fiction? It's not a fi- it's, it's legal and it's not a fiction. Okay, legal fiction is, the rules are there, but we're just getting around the laws by creating a fictional state. Legal, most laws are not fiction. Legal fiction is when you do something you know you're not really you don't really mean, and you're just trying to get around the law. Tor- legal fictions are a problem, by the way. You know, there's some some rabbi types say avoid legal fictions at all costs. They're, they're not right. But this is an abstract legality of the Torah, in order to once again drive home the point that most of this is in the mind. It is a it is an exercise of the mind, and therefore, like many things. Even though many people who are not Jewish can accomplish the commandments, they want to keep the Torah, there is no category about them. A Gentile doesn't have impurity, and a Gentile doesn't have purity. It, it, it doesn't affect him whatsoever. We would, sell, we would tell the Gentile fellow, you want to come to our bias, well, make sure you're physically clean, you know, and you're, you're wearing proper clothes and respect the laws that were here, but you do not have to go to mikvah, and it doesn't accomplish anything if you do. <clears throat> And if you went to a funeral yesterday, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. We will stop you from going beyond this point anyways, because this is for Jews and this is not. That's all. And for, you know what? Is, is, is it a good there on non-Jewish women? That's not a legal fiction. It's the sage is creative. Legal fiction is not the right word, but doesn't yeah. have the same status of Puma or something like that, right? No, it's just that Jews should know. The only thing that they said, Jew, Gentile women and Gentile men. It means that they do not want Jews fraternizing with non-Jews. Intermarriage is bad. There's nothing wrong with Gentiles, by the way. They could marry amongst each other. And if they wish to marry among the Jews, for whatever reason, they, they, will really, they really believe in Judaism. They believe in God. They want to keep them its vote. Let them convert to Judaism. That's, very, that's something that they could do. It's an, always an option. And if they're legitimate about it, if they're sincere, we welcome them. It just means that in order for the Jew distance him to, should distance himself from, let's say, a relationship with this Gentile woman, we have decreed that relations with this woman will lead to her contaminating him. Aside from the fact that, by the way, it's forbidden for other reasons, and the Torah has the usual consequences, there were, it used to be a way to dissuade people. If a man knew, for example, there's some people, I don't know why, Yates of Horror works in a very strange way. There are some people who are more promiscuous by nature than others, correct? That's just how some people are. You have a man who you cannot tell him, please, don't just sleep with these random women. And he will not listen. But for some reason, if you tell him, you don't understand, that will make that act will make you impure for the next seven days, until you, and then you'll be able to go to mikvah to purify yourself like a nida. Suddenly he'll think twice. And the Talmud has stories about this, where a person basically was dissuaded from doing something, not because he realized it was a capital offense even, but because of some other minor consequence thereof that he didn't want to have. Yes, yeah, Shmuel. It's even in the Torah that if like, someone who sleeps with an uh, Anita becomes Tamil for seven to eight days. And yeah. I, I don't remember where I read this, but I was really... Confused. But he gets karate for that. Yeah, he gets the karate is not... Like yeah. So the answer is, you know what the problem is? Here's how it goes. Many, many Torah uh, prohibitions, what is the punishment? Mitabi de shamayim. Karate. Or there is no punishment. There is no physical punishment in this world. When you don't have someone telling you, hey, don't do that, or we're going to punish you with lashes, or we're going to stone you, chas So So that, that's not a deterrent for some reason, because they don't see it. Telling people, yeah, you will be cut off from your people, whatever karate is, by the way, not so clear. The Rambam says that's the worst thing that could happen to someone. Okay? There's some, but there are a lot of, you do sing on Yom Kippur. Lighting the fire in Yom Kippur is karate. Lighting on Shabbos, people might be dissuaded why because they could get stoned. Your neighbor's looking, and two neighbors, they warn you, hey, don't strike that match on Shabbos, You're going, or we're going to have you stoned. So that might, might, might deter him. On Yom Kippur, maybe they'll tell him, oh, you could get lashes for such a thing, but the main penalty is some idea that you will not be involved in the world to come. 
So that doesn't dissuade them. So you tell them, oh, and by the way, you'll also be impure for seven days. You won't be able to attend Passover or Seder with your, with your family. For some reason, that's a deterrent. And the sages found that in quite, quite a few cases. So they said that, treat the Gentiles as though they make you impure. But it doesn't, the Gentiles, it doesn't affect them. Okay? And for some reason, that worked as a deterrent back in the day when these things mattered. Imagine being impure meant you could not enter the temple complex if you, if you were this type of committed this sin, so you couldn't enter the temple even to atone for what you did for a whole seven days, at least. So that was a sufficient deterrent, uh, uh, surprisingly. Yeah. No. Sorry, once the sages decree that the say, there's a lot that we're going to see, God willing, that's where we're holding the book of Torah. The sages decreed all sorts of tumah for all sorts of reasons. And repentance does not remove it. You still have no, to go. Not, not removing the tumah. And there's tumah because if somebody slept with a nidah, yeah. he could do tshuva, and then Hashem might forgive him. And then, okay, well, and now he has the tumah. Yeah, now he has the tumah, so he has to remove it. Yeah. But he has to do, go through the whole ritual, the seven days, etc., that yeah, require ruining it. Was, why is there tumah if it's karet? There, there's tumah, so that because this whole thing is a deterrent. By the way, that's a major uh, factor in the whole idea of why is there mikvah? Why did the Torah say you have to go to mikvah for certain things? The approach given, the Maimonidean approach given in the Dot Mikra is basically to tell you, avoid certain activities because it's inconvenient to have to go to mikvah just to be able to get on with your life and do the rest of the mitzvahs. It teaches you to be less uh, sexually active. That's basically what it comes down to. You guys should all get married and understand this, that mikvah basically makes you a holier person because, well, nowadays we made it so that mikvah is convenient. I know the, all the, the great men I know have personal mikvahs, so it doesn't, they sort of got over this hump. But in the olden days, you would have thought twice and restricted your activity because it meant that you'd have to go to mikvah so often. You might as well, once you've gone to mikvah, keep yourself pure and avoid the things that make you have to go to mikvah again. Yeah, well, what's the question? So we said that last week, when everything in the temple is impure with death impurity, which is not removed by the same way as other forms of impurity, then we go through the temple service and we push aside that impurity. But if everybody, let's say, has bodily impurity, the types of impurities that people get from seminal missions, touching dead lizards and rodents, uh, all these other things we've been describing now, there's no way around that. You have to go to mikvah. You have to get things purified. And some things take a longer time. Some some impurities are removed by a simple immersion and then waiting for nightfall. Some take a whole week. So we it's not that's not really the case. We'll 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 get to another chapter where we discuss this in in greater detail. We can't just say, "Oh, everybody's tummy, that's it," or "Everything's tummy." Go along with it. No, we have to remove whatever tuma we can. Which is very interesting, by the way. There are forms of tuma that we contract that are removed through immersion in mikvah. But there's other forms that are removed through that sprinkling with the paraduma water. By the way, how much how much paraduma? What's the shiur of paraduma water? It takes to remove the impurity one gets from, let's say, I don't know, burying a person. Nope, not even. Yeah, well, you know, one drop. One drop. It says the whole family stands there. The kohen takes the the hyssop and dips it in the water and goes like that. One drop, just one drop on the third day. One drop out on the seventh day. Yes, the sages then said that they told people go to mikvah at the end of that day also. They do something, but the 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 purification for from death is count one day, two day on day three get sprinkled, four, five, six on day seven get sprinkled. Amazing, it's such an extreme form of purity uh, of 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 contamination. Yet the purification process is so simple. It's like almost made people it almost made people forget about it or or deride such a thing, which is why the sages said they added their own layers that take it seriously. So that's why you can't understand. It's all abstract, like the Rambam says. The death impurity should be removed by doing this elaborate ritual with the red cow, et cetera, and in the water, and how you combine it. Yes, Shmuel. Um, on Sarah, uh, Rob Kirsch has a, has a whole, not essay, but it's a whole about why it should not be what, called leprosy whatsoever. Of course, yeah, leprosy and refers to an old disease. That, like, the Kohen declares when someone is coming. Yeah. In other words, up until that point, they're not coming whatsoever, even though they have all the symptoms. Yes. And not only that, they have to go to the co Kohen. Mm -hmm. A person who wants to stay pure, even though he's obviously he has, let's say, the, the Bohak and the Baharit on his face. It's like right there. Everybody sees it. As long as the Kohen has not pronounced it, or let's say he's covering it up, 
you know, he doesn't go, then nothing happens. The stage one of Tzara'at, the Torah's idea of Tzara'at, or was the sage called Niga'im, these various afflictions, is that a person has to want to change. Cure of rabbis, fair line. How many cure of rabbis does it take to change a light bulb, Robert? You know? No, it depends. But first, the light bulb has to want to change. Okay? So the guy has to want that want to change, and then he can it does it. What's well, the question? The progress at first it starts in the skin, then to his body, and then very much his house. Or the Rambam has the other way: it starts in his house. It's first hidden. No one else sees it. He doesn't invite anybody to his bedroom. I, you don't know what my bedroom looks like, so you don't know if I have a red spot on the wall, right? Okay, then it shows up in the clothing. So I'll hide that clothing. Or I'll stay at home. And then it shows up on his skin, but he's still at home. You don't see it. You know, it. The first stage is a person is willing to admit he has something wrong and invite the coin in there. Why would you want the Kohen to come and de declare impurity in your entire house and ruin all everything you have there and make you have to knock down part of the wall and, and fix it? Only people who invite the Kohen to go and see this are going to suffer these consequences. You could just ignore it. Fine. Ignore your Averas. You speak Lush and Hur all the time. You don't want to change yourself. Go right ahead. See what, ha see what it brings you. But going to the Kohen is a first step of, of admitting one's own guilt and letting someone else have a look at it. And that's, a very important, that's a very important thing in, in, in Teshuvah. Being open about yourself and confessing. It's part of the confessing, uh, confessional process. Okay, let's see the next halacha. This is a very good idea. Guys, by the way, interrupt with questions. If you have a question or if you want to say something, you think something's wrong. Or if you disagree with the Rambam. I'm using a different text than you're using. I'm using the Korean edition because that's the one I had beforehand. And I have my, my footnotes in it, my own stuff. But you guys in Makbili, you're going to see that we're going to get to some major differences. I found uh, some textual differences between the two of them. It says here, Elo yakifobi bachutz. You have to go through Harabayas. Don't go around it. You're allowed to use Jerusalem as a shortcut. Veloi kaneis lo ela lidvar mitzvah. More musr. We don't go to Harabayas because we have photo opportunities or because we need something to do with the kids. We do it for dvar mitzvah. Luckily, dvar mitzvah is, is a little bit open. If you're going there for prayer, that counts. And as we saw, Rav Ariel brings here. Unfortunately, today. Really, a guy like me, when would I go to the temple? If the temple were standing, when, when would I go to the temple? I would go on holidays. Yeah, I don't need to go on a weekday. I definitely don't need to go twice in the month of Av. So why do we need people to go now? Only because we need Jews to go there now. But God willing, when we rebuild the temple and there'll be regular presence there, we will not have to go there all the time. So we go to the temple, Dafka, at times for prayer which is a Devar Mitzvah, or for Torah study. But Stam, just to go there, a little bit questionable. We don't want met large crowds of Jewish youth going there in their T-shirts with their dirty feet. That's bad. Maybe it's not a Devar Mitzvah. Some people are mamish rabbi. Thank God we don't have these kinds of guys. So some guys maybe just go there to make trouble with Arabs. I know I met one guy who was like that. That's not right. But yes, what we're doing now, unfortunately, is, is a mitzvah today, and it shouldn't have to be a mitzvah. The, the kibush aspect. Yeah, Josh, what's up? Um, what is the fear of kibush aspect today still? Yeah, it is. That, that's unfortunate that we have to do this. Like I said, I went twice in the month of Av because of the kibush aspect. Okay, so I, I did it. I was invited to uh, speak a little bit. It's important to tell people this. But really, I wouldn't be going there so often. Is there supposed to be a shiva in Harbaiz? Is there supposed to be a base in Agado? There's not supposed to be just people who go and do that. So, but you could go for shear. Rabbi Gamaliel gave shear on Har Bayis in the shadow of the temple. So, God willing, these are these are considered devar mitzvah. But it is not something we go for photo opportunities with political figures. Unfortunately, and you shouldn't be taking selfies on Har Bayis. That's not what it's there for. Okay, and we don't want to lose it. We don't want God to you know to look at these things. It's not for that. It has to be a devar mitzvah. Basically, whichever way you have to go, make your right turns. What look like counterclockwise from a bird's eye view, and that's the way people go do that circuit around Harbais. That's considered uh, the kavod. Remember, he says this part of reverence of the temple means you walk to your right. Going on. Someone who has something happened to him. He's an avelut, for example. Shahu Makif Alasmol. He goes the opposite way. That way people can say hello to him. The Fihakhayushalimlo, when they would encounter people like this, everybody's doing what they have to do. They're basically going along the conveyor belt in this way, and this guy's going backwards. They'd ask him, What's up? What's wrong with you? Well, no matter which way you go on, how about you eventually make a 
Where? So if you enter and you turn right to go around. Oh yeah, going yeah, you go so, yeah, yeah, eventually. But either way, the point is you go in that counterclockwise path that we're doing. They call that yamin. So if someone's going clockwise around Harbais, what does it mean? You have to ask him what's going on here. I heard people actually did this today. He says, Ani Avel, Shani Avel, I'm I'm in Avelut. So Hashokin Babay Daze Yinachem Kha. So the person would respond, okay, so the, he who dwelleth in this temple should comfort you. Ari would say, Shani Minudeh. Minudeh is pretty bad. That means uh, he's in uh, he, he's in uh, Cherem. He's like a Nida. The, the word Nida, by the way, let's learn some grammar for a second because uh, we should learn gra- grammar. You have a dot in the letter in Hebrew after the vowel. It's called a Dagesh Chazak. It indicates another missing letter. Usually a letter of the root is is being is being compensated for because it's missing. The shorish of nida, in this case, nun dalit hey, or a min nudeh, which is not written malay, there's always a dot in the in the dalid, is from the shorish what? Yes. So that means set aside. So a woman who is uh was menstruant is set aside. She's sort of out of the house, she's separated from her husband. And a person's min nudeh is nida in the in the sense that he is what? He's separated from his friends. In Migilat Echa, when it says, Linida Hayata, she became like a Nida, that's written Nun Yud Dalit He. That's not the word Nida in, in, in this case. That The Yud is part of the Shoresh, or it should be above. What's the Shoresh of Nida, Nun Yud Dalit, or Nun Vav Dalit? What does that mean? It means, well, yes. It means someone who has to be moving around too much. Al Kain Linida Hayata, that's why Nida is really pronounced Nida. There's no dot in the dalid. The shorish is completely there. That means she has gone into wandering. She is a wanderer, not a menstruant or a woman who's been put aside. So too, uh, do we see this last week, the, the two types of mechitzot that you could have in Hebrew? The common mechitzah that we use in the synagogue, and which comes up in the Talmud, we're talking about building uh, halachic walls on Shabbos, Eruvin, or to build your sukkah. So that is written memchet tzadi hei, there's a dot in the tzadi, and the chirik is a chirik katan. It's mihissa. You have to accent, uh, sorry, emphasize the tzadi, and it's a short chirik sound. There's no yud. Why? What is the shorish of that divider? Very good. Chet tzadi tzadi, as in a chotzeitz. Chotzeitz is the thing that you can't have on your body when you want to dunk in the mikvah. Well, like a chatzitza also. So there, the shorish is chet tzadi tzadi. So mihissa has a dot in the tzadi, like the word tifila and tichina. Tifilah is from the Shorish, Pei Lamid Lamid. So there's a dot in the one Lamid in the word prayer. So too, Tichina, a supplication. The Shorish is Chet Nun Nun. When we talk about this one supplication, there's only one Nun in the, in the word. So the Nun in the word gets a dot, Dagesh, uh, to show you that there's a missing Nun there. Whereas the word Mechi Sa, Mem Chet Yud Tzadi Hei, no dot in the Tzadi, is for the word Machatz. There's a Mochetz. Mochetz means like cut something in half. Mechatz motnaim kamav, smite his enemies through the loins. Um sanav mini kumun, and uh, his, and uh, those who rise up against him or those who hate him, so they never get up again. Okay, that's God's blessing to the shevet levi. Or machatz rosh al eretz rabba. So that's the word mochetz. So a mechitza would be the would be the gerund form of that. I think. Okay, so we have to know when when these words have dots when they don't, and uh, we'll talk about this more. So this person is basically told, oh, I'm in Cheyrim, basically. So what's he doing on Harbais? So it means he can't hang out with his friends. So just like an Ovil. An Ovil, what's the main thing he does during Shloshim or during the 12 months? The main prohibition an Ovil has is, it's called Simcha Mereyut. Yeah. Reyut is from, you know, having friends. And Simcha is going to, you know, social gatherings, basically. That's the thing that, that Avilim are not supposed to do. So they're very much in the same boat. The person who's in Cheyrim and the person who's in Ovil. They say to him, God should put in your heart to just stop being so stubborn. Anida was basically uh, like Rabbi Elizabeth ben Herkinus. He was so insistent on maintaining his position that they said, okay, we have to put in your harem until you decide to go along with the majority. So too, the person who's in this position, the, the solution was that he would just decide to do what everybody else was telling him to do, and then they would let him out in harem. So that's the blessing. Hold on, we're getting a question over here from someone in Interland. Uh, yeah, who's taking pictures? Anybody have a, a phone? I own it. <laughs> Told the kids, let's take it. Let's get a camera and take pictures. Like, what's a camera? Use a phone to take pictures. 
Okay, so Nehemiah, uh, I, I, does anybody want to take a picture here? Want to take a picture of me, I guess, of books? Someone take a picture, okay? Thank you for the suggestion. And if there's any real questions, just put them in the chat also. Let's go on to the fourth halakha. This is something I want to ask. The kids ask me why we didn't do this because look exactly with us. When you leave Harbais, what are people doing? They start turning around a little bit, correct? They walk backwards. Let's learn the halakha. Let's see when it is supposed to be put into practice and let's see when it's not. Person who finishes the service and now he's going. A Kohen, when he finishes the service, by the way, he actually does it in the temple edifice, in the same room where the menorah was, so they get to bow down there. It says here, a person's finished with the service. Let's say a regular Jew brought uh, a peace offering to the, or a todab, to the actual court, temple of, uh, courtyard of the temple. So he's leaving the temple courtyard. What should he do? And you don't know, say, he does not leave and have his back to the temple. Instead, he sort of goes, walks a little bit backwards or walks sideways so as not to turn his face, not to show his back to the temple as he leaves. But what does it say here? I underlined here, Minha Azara, the temple courtyard. It's not talking about leaving the temple mount. The Anshay Mishmar, those are the Kohanim who are on duty. Anshay Mahmad is the Jews who are on duty. If I remember what the Imamat is, as I'll say, we're gonna we read about this soon in the Rambam also. You can't have who works in the temple, Kohanim and Levim. Then Chazal realized it cannot be that a man would send his sacrifice to the temple and his representative isn't there. He himself isn't there. So too, because the Korban Tamid is on behalf of the entire Jewish people, the Jewish people need representatives in the temple. Israelite representatives. They're called the Mahmadot. Select group of people who are there to attend the temple service as observers, and they're also supposed to be offering prayers and fasting as the sacrifices are offered. Those are the Mahmadi, Mahmadot. They well, well they no, they're not. The wood bringers were very specific families. Okay, only like a few li- that's listed in the Mishnah, and that was it. These regular people were just representatives of the people. Uh, and the Levim, when they left their, their platform, what were the Levim doing on the platform? They were singing. That's how they leave the Mikdash. Like you leave your, how, many, how do you, when you're done praying, how do you walk? Three steps backward. Doesn't it mean every single step you take backwards? So technically speaking, it's a good thing when you're leaving the Mikdash. Remember, all our bite is Mikdash, but it's not like, oh, you can't actually walk forwards out of the Temple Mount when we actually leave. Once you, you know, took a few steps backwards and you were on sideways, Good enough. It's it's not really normal to walk entirely backwards. You could fall down. That's not respectful. It just becomes silly. Chas v'shalom, though, something that should not be done is that people leave the Kotel like this. The Kotel Plaza is a synagogue. So it has to be treated with reverence of a synagogue. As we said last week, the Kotel Plaza is meant to be basically the parking lot of the temple. And as, uh, as unfortunately happened, the temple, the Kotel Plaza has replaced the temple in the eyes of many Jews. They treat it like their temple. And then they treat the Kotel like it's some sort of, it is the, it is the, the edge of the whole, it's holy place in Judaism. And therefore, when they leave the Kotel Plaza, they do this whole walk backwards thing, so not to turn their back on the Kotel. It's wrong to do such a thing, because that's, that's not what the halacha asks for. But more than that, it's, it's an insult to the actual temple. It was uh, Lama de Vardome. What happened, uh, well, Leon, Leon and Shmuel got to see firsthand on Shabbos. Uh, someone made a very fancy Haftarah book for the Shul. Now, these Svartic Sefer Torahs, what is it? It's just the Sefer Torah. The Ashkenazic or Svartic Sefer Torah doesn't really matter if you put a mantle on it or you put a, a case around it. Okay? So the Sefer Torah cases are looking very fancy now. It's, you're a photographer, but you're not here. So someone else will have to take the pictures, I guess. The, the Sefer Torah comes in a case. It's a very fancy case. So this fellow has the Haftorah book. He wrote the Haftorah on cloth. Then he wrote, you know, he put in the dots and he put instructions. It's written on cloth, but it's not even a whole book of the Bible. Remember, just pieces of certain Nevi'im and not even that many. So it's just the Haftorah. So technically speaking, this printed Korean Bible has more sanctity than a Haftorah book. But what did he do? He put it in a case that looks like a Sefer Torah case. So when it comes time to read the Haftarah, they take it out of the Aron, 
And this thing looks like a safer Torah. For a safer Torah, what do you do when it when it's walk when it's being moved around? You have to stand up for a safer Torah. Correct? That's that's an obligation. So what was happening the first few months after this fellow donated this new Haftarah book was people were getting up. They open up the Aron, they take this, this Haftarah book to the table, and I had to tell people, sit down. Why? Because if you show the respect of a Torah, okay, oh, photos on Harabite. You could take photos on Harabite, but it, it, it's getting a little bit out of hand, perhaps. There's someone who documents things. It's good to do that. Um, so, yes, you need to take pictures of documentation. Uh, God knows the Arabs are doing that. My, my daughters told me that they were taking a lot of pictures of me. Okay? Who knows? It's kind of threat. No, it's threatening. When the wrong people are taking pictures of you, you don't want that. Uh, but uh, it, it, the problem was I saw people taking selfies and things like that, or just because their celebrities are going hard by. It's just like, oh, look at me. I'm with so-and-so. But that, that's not exactly what we do. Even at the Koto Plaza, it's a little bit, um, I get what's the word here? It's improper. So uh, back to this. Treating the Kotel Plaza with the reverence, or treating the Kotel with the reverence of the temple, is not only just wrong intellectually, it's an insult to the temple. It's like a Vodazara. One aspect of Vodazara is treating this idol, or even the, the stars and the moon, they're great, they're amazing things, the sun. But you're giving it God's reverence. You're treating it with the reverence you should be treating God himself. That's an insult. I yes, assume, what? I assume the mayor would be called the home of the people that do that with every book that they take the door. Yeah, it's not, it's not called for. They should know how to treat. Now, giving something too much kavod and not giving, giving the kavod that belongs to God to something else is already a little bit of an insult. Yeah. And how about um, the most recessions that are in the temple? The mikdash me'at is important. There are certain rules of what you're allowed to do in the, in the synagogue and whatnot. But a synagogue is not the temple. You could wear your shoes in synagogue. There's technically a way you could spit in the synagogue when it used to have a dirt floor. You can't do that. If you suddenly treat the synagogue with the standards you do of the temple and you do not go to the temple, it's a little bit of a problem. Okay. It, well, a vote because you're not worshiping, it's not a vodazara. A vodazara was when you actually, the respect you're supposed to give to God. Thank you, God. Please, God, etc. God, you are great. Okay, what can you do to God? You could praise God, you could thank him, and you could supplicate. The three things you do. First you praise, then you ask, then you thank. You do those three things to something that is not God, now you're doing idolatry. When you show respect of, let's say, even just to respect due to the synagogue to, I don't know, the, the baseball stadium, that's an insult. That's not a vodazara, but it's an insult. So too, when you respect the synagogue like you respect the temple, you're giving the synagogue too much respect, and it's basically replacing the temple, which is bad. You know, it, 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 it's it's wrong on many levels. Yeah, so so know how to treat the, the, the temple and know that we do this backwards thing, when, specifically in the temple. There is no such issue with regards to the synagogue, except prayer. How do you end your prayer? Three steps backwards while staying, while facing forward, but then you could turn around. Okay, so to the, te the, the synagogue, this base matters. By the way, this base matters. There's not even a safer Torah in here. I think there might be, sometimes there's one that's Pasul. So there's a little bit of Kedusha here. But they, they barely ever have a Torah here where they read from. So this is not, thank God, there's a few leniencies are available here. Uh, the fifth halacha. Lo yekel adam et rosho keneged sharam is rachish shel azara. A person should not be lightheaded. It means make jokes, etc. Not uh, lack of seriousness. Uh, when he is opposite the sharam is rachish of the azara. And by the way, this might even be the entire Mount of Olives area. Why? Because the temple was on a mountaintop, and it's sort of the highest point. So you have to be very careful. And thank God nowadays there's not many people who hang out in these areas, but that was that's the halacha. This entrance to the courtyard is called Shar Nikonor. It's exactly opposite the Holy of Holies. And as you know, what they do in the morning they, they opened up the Nicanor gates, so the Azara is open, and then they would open up the gates of the temple. So basically speaking, once the temple doors are open, from the east, you could look all the way into the temple. And all that was separating someone viewing from the Kodesh Kodeshim is what? The curtain. So the curtain's not really a, it's not a doorway or anything like that. And sometimes they'd even open up the curtain on holidays. So it's very important that this be, this be uh, you know, people be serious when they're exactly opposite the Holy of Holies. You have a question about that? No. Okay, next. Whoever goes into the courtyard of the temple has to walk 
nicely, gently, and only the place where he's allowed to go. We're going to see the Rambam basically drew a line across the Azara up until this point regular Jews are allowed to go. And by the way, we're going to see Allah, sometimes in Passover, the crowds just like, it, it basically fell apart. So people even sometimes enter the, the, the Kodesh, the actual room where the, where the, where the Kalim were. It was kind of difficult, but they weren't supposed to go there. Saying, avoid going to where you're not supposed to go. VR, uh, VR eh or your eh? What do you guys have? Uh, your eh, I have here. Means he should see himself. Your eh, it's more should see himself or your eh, he should demonstrate among himself. You have it with a pata or a kirik? Kirik? Okay. Vir eh, it's more shahu omeid lifneha don Hashem. He should see himself, he should perceive himself as standing in front of the master, the Lord. Shamar, the you ain't I will be sham koyamim. This is Pasuk actually a few times in Tanakh. Okay, my my eyes and my heart shall be there all the days, means means forever. Umalech beimav yira fachad urada. He should walk in fear, reverence. Uh pachad is trepidation, rada, he should be trembling. Sometimes it means charada. As it says, Bevedalhim na lech biragesh. We shall go to the house of God be biragesh. Ragesh means with emotions. We should do it with emotional understanding. You could tell someone's walking seriously. He should not be walking frivolously, even on Harabayas, but call the Homer in the Azara. He walks in the Azara, he has to have extreme reverence when he's walking there. What's the question? What's the punishment, <clears throat> What's the punishment for uh, Tahor to go into the parts of the Azara? Well, it depends on Tahor from even from Tumat Mate. Yeah. Well, he's not allowed there. Technically speaking, if he's uh, if he has no Tumat Mate, he's just doing something wrong if he has no business there. Yeah. Okay? So Minastam. Well, it's not a love because people used to go there when they were when they're pure. They have a sacrifice to give, but there's no loitering in the temple. You can't just say I want to come here, stam. If you wanted to pray, let's say I wanted to offer prayer, I came empty-handed. That's not right. If you're coming to the temple and you want to pray in the temple, you should at least have I don't know some a meal offering, offer you know, a bottle of wine, something. There's by the way limits. There's 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 a lower there's minimums you have to bring for sacrifice. So a person with sacrifice, it's fine. But if he has, if he's empty-handed and he says, "I want to pray here, I want to bow down," so they tell him, "So there's a prayer area to the north or to the south. Go there, join a minion there, join Rabbi Gamliel Shir, and he's going to break Shir for Mar for Mincha and Marv, and you, you can join that. But you can't just enter the courtyard for no good reason. And the problem was that, let's say, attending the Yom Kippur service was a good reason. What does it say in the Mishnah? We saw this Mishnah again. You could, you could learn so much from this Mishnah. What sacrifices were brought on Yom Kippur? They're all communal ones, right? Regular sacrifices, voluntary sacrifices or sin offerings of private individuals are obviously not offered on Yom Kippur. What does it say was what happened on Yom Kippur when the Kohen Gadol showed up to start the Avodah? The place was packed already. Regular Jews say, I want to be there when the Kohen Gadol is doing this. I want to be able among the people who are going to bow down when he says God's name. So that's, that, that's okay. So we can go into the Azarah. They let him in there. I want to be there where the Koen Gadol says Vidui. So they had a crowd. What are they going to do? People actually did. They, they, I guess wherever first come, first serve, whoever can get in there. Standing room only. So there is, there's no punishment as long as a person has the right, can, has the right reasons for being there. Adarabo, it would be a good thing. You know, uh, I, I imagine how much of a crowd there was just people who wanted to be there for the Tamid. I want to be there for the morning Tamid when they... Uh, I don't know how much, uh, I want to hear the, the, I want to be there when the, when the Levim are singing. I want to attend it for that. It's not, it's obviously the minority of the, the, the day is, is taken up by that, but that would be a legitimate reason. Yeah, there's, there's so much we're, we're detached from, you know. It's amazing how we haven't, we haven't thought about this, how this would affect our lives. <coughs> I would imagine like there are many, like I said last week, there are many pious people who go to the Kotel all the time. They daven every single daven here. They're at the Kotel every day at least. There will probably be people like that once the base of Mikdash is built. Yeah, P people, regular people like me will be lucky if we could get there every holiday. But there will be people who will be regular attendees at the temple just because, and they'll have pious activities, or it could be, like we had times in the Chazal, a person who brought a sin offering every day just to put, keep it safe, if you're wealthy enough to do such a thing. Who knows? I don't know. Or maybe it'll be like R Ruff Cook's uh, dream. Eventually, all animal sacrifice will be done away with. Right, you've heard about this parasha. Mm -hmm. So somehow the temple will go will go vegan, except on Passover. Yeah. What? Well, you mean Maimonides? 
I don't know if Rambam never said, I'm reading right now, Rambam's talking about, he finishes his whole book by saying the Messiah comes, they'll rebuild the temple, and then we'll offer all the sacrifices we used to do. So I don't know if that's Rambam necessarily. The Rambam doesn't have an idea that sacrifice is not the ideal. But then again, this whole idea that men need a place to pray, the fact that there's even a place to pray instead of just everybody sitting around and meditating on their own, that's already a concession. Basically, religion, organized religion is a concession to human uh, shortcoming, correct? So in my mind, in the ideal, we wouldn't have this, but Lemaisa, Rambam rules like these things. So uh, yeah, Rav, it was, it's Rav Cook basically, who had this uh, vegan vision for the future. You're looking skeptically. You've... It's like every time I, I hear that mentioned, I think, I think I, I know why I think this is mentioned all the time. Like, most people don't know anything Rav Cook wrote, or they barely know. They just know his religious side. Whatever. Well, he did write this that. This is the thing they know, because yeah. they, will, they are uncomfortable with sacrifices, or they are somehow, they think of it as archaic. And so, as soon as they're told something like, oh, things are going to change, they're going to have a different Torah in the future, essentially, they, they start to feel good. Or... I think it's the same reason people get attracted to we're going to follow Shammai in the future, something that Ari supposedly said. Uh, yeah. They're attracted to this because they don't like the current Torah. And so I've never liked these kinds of ideas. The problem is, turns out not only did Ruff Cook write this, and it's well known that he did, they even came out some kiss fayat of his in the last uh, 12 years where he went even further with these ideas. But it's rough cook. You know, it's, it's all theoretical. It's not like he's espousing that rebuild the temple and stop offering sacrifice. I was just having to mention it. I don't think, I don't think that it will go like that. Uh, Adarabah, as you know, I'm pretty much an advocate for, let's say, the reinstitution of the sacrificial service immediately, and also the Korban Pesach especially, which would be quite fun, you know, from, from the kids' aspect. I'm not thinking like, oh, yeah, I want to have fun. I mean, Korban Pesach is supposed to be get the kids excited about mitzvahs. So for me, getting the, that's exciting. But not like, you know, oh, fun. You know, I, I don't know how to slaughter an animal. I don't, I don't, think, I, I don't think I have the guts to do it. So I'll probably have to let someone else do it. What's the question? Maybe. One thing I do know is that, uh, one, it's, it's not so bad. I think that certainly it will be a lot less than it used to be, the quantities. Nowadays, it's not the type of thing that will appeal to many people. So it will certainly be less than it used to be in the olden days. You know, I wonder if we grow the meat, like you slaughter the animal, like they grow meat now, like you can actually like grow it. No, that... you slaughter the animal, take a piece from the animal, and then you would grow it. Would, wouldn't it be like the same if you like, have the conducive with it from the animal? This sounds like science fiction that's not practical. So we'll only deal with these types of questions when it's actually a practical question. Well, they're no, but they're not 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 they're not mass producing it enough that it's a common thing, you know. The, the, I've I've read about you know lab grown meat, etc., but that's not something we could do in quantities. That how how expensive is that stuff? It's not something that's that's practical. Besides, it's not about the meat; it's about the actual act of sacrifice. I have a very nice book that was given to me by the the fellow who was leading the tour there. The theoretical ideas behind this. It's not a technical thing that God wants a certain amount of meat. Remember, it's your intentions. And part of the intention is the, the act of sacrificing ze tachat ze, okay? And mostly the blood, etc. cetera. And, and well, well, we'll get into those, we'll get into these ideas. I don't think that Rough Cook is necessarily right, but I do think that we have approached this part where certainly the religious nature of most people is not inclined towards sacrifice. So there'll be a lot less voluntary sacrifice but then again, like Dr. England said this, I think just last month, he said, once it comes back, for all we know, we will be much more into human, sa not humans, will be so much more into, yeah, no, not humans. Maybe that. Yeah. No, humans will, want, will actually become, will, we've been so disconnected from this all these thousands of years that we've forgotten this. But the second it comes back, we'll start getting into it and start realizing, oh, there is something to this. We don't need these Maimonidean ideas. Or rough cook ideas. Maybe, you know, even if when even Rambam himself would realize, oh, I understand. He was, he could have been a product of his times. Because it seems very clear from the Torah and the sages that this is what God wants. I remember one of the, I, I think I talked about this in the previous year. We were talking about Korm Pesach in various places before Pesach. And one young lady asked me straight up, because uh, she was basically made to attend the lecture, says, 
We learned that it's not an ideal. So why are you trying to bring it back? Aren't we reaching this ideal? Yeah, but I, I, why, I, why do you I, even I, want I, it back? And I don't like that idea being taught. I can tell you don't like it, but let's let's work with my question. Why do I want to bring it back? It was a good question. Assuming like this, let's say my monodean idea that sacrifice is not an ideal. So why are we happy with the fact we don't have sacrifices? Well, we tried to bring it back. And the answer is one, first let's bring back the temple. The idea of a temple, we all understand. People need a place of worship. And the idea, Rambam says, it's a place of pilgrimage. It's also a unifying symbol for the people. Those are all good. Sacrifice itself, I'll tell you what. One thing you discover with your spouse is, especially if you have to, let's say, teach this to women. If your spouse is definitely a man, what you do to keep your spouse happy is do that which he said keeps him happy. So if a man likes his eggs fried a certain way in the morning, it would be good if the woman learns to do that and doesn't say, serve him some oatmeal. Definitely, if she should if she make the eggs, don't boil them. Fry them the way he likes and they'll be happy. Just do what he's asked for. And so too, when it comes to getting stuff for your, your wife for her birthday, don't try to be clever and be like, oh, I'll try to get her this present because you'll be wrong and she won't like that. Just get her what she's been dropping hints about. Or maybe she said explicitly, it's like, when my birthday comes around or anniversary, I would like X, Y, and Z. You know what you should do? Record that. In the old days, you had to write it down on a piece of paper and hope it stays in your wallet so you remember it. But nowadays, you just have a phone because phones record everything, even the stuff that you don't want recorded and even other people recording for you. Your wife tells you she wants something. You know what you should do? Do what she said. And that's what the Torah is. I love God. God loves us. And you know what he did? He gave us a Torah and he gave us a lot of explanation. He gave us sages to explain this to us that this is what God wants. And lo and behold, I found that there's even a whole book of the Bible basically dedicated to this. And God has said, build me a house. And here's what you do in that house. And bring me these sheep and bring me these goats and do it this way. And that's what he wants. And you know, reach nichoach means, what is a reach nichoach? It means God is satisfied by that aroma. He's like the husband, give me this food. Robert, do you know what the Unculus translates reach nichoach as? Satisfying aroma? Anybody study Unculus? What does Unculus always say? Yeah, it's accepted with favor. Because that's what God wants. As Rashi says, right at the beginning of Vayikra, what does it mean, reach nichoach? It means God's like, I told them to do this, and they did what I said. Now I'm happy. So that's a very basic religious idea, that I want to do what God said. He told me to do this. Here's the opportunity. I will do it. So I'm not going to start coming up with all sorts of, yes, these lofty ideas. Rav Cook was a genius. And Mimosha to Moshe, there was no one like Moshe. So Ramam's like basically another Moses. But even if they're theoretically right, we're still going to try to offer sacrifice because that is Straight up what God has commanded us to do. And not only that, Corbin Pesach especially, other Korbanot, if I missed it, I missed it. I just have to make sure to try doing the next day better. But Corbin Pesach, if I don't do Corbin Pesach and the opportunity to do it, it's as bad as if I didn't get myself circumcised. That's pretty bad. It's like cutting myself off. Okay, You could either cut off the Orla, or you could have yourself cut off from your people. And that's why we want to restore the temple service, because God said so. And that's the bottom line. Yeah. But within Rambam, it's such a problem. Yeah. Like, like, what do you, because it, it's not like, like some idea that some, it's like very explicit in the more that the purpose of the law is to wean us off these activities. Yeah. And if we've been weaned off the activity that was supposed to wean us off of other activities, then why would we pick up a vice that we don't feel a need to do anything? Have we really been weaned off of it? <laughs> Somewhat forcibly. Did we accomplish what we needed to accomplish? What did we need to accomplish? Well, I don't know. I'm wondering, God, Rambam has this idea also, in his introduction to the Mishnah Torah, also written in Arabic, translated for us, the idea that commandments are meant to be eternal. Correct? And there are certain ones that are not. The ones that are not technically eternal are not numbered. They're one-time injunctions. Apparently, that which we have to learn through the sacrifices is not something that was going to be one generation or maybe even a number of generations or a few centuries. It's something that every generation has to have, and therefore it's an eternal commandment. What was a commandment that wasn't eternal, for example? This whole, uh, what? Keep the land out of, keep the people out of the land. You know, that's also eternal. It just technically, you, you can't do it with Canaanites anymore, but you can still hold on to land. What? Really? What? Yeah, Miluim okay. had, had to initiate the, the service for Kohanim or the a prohibition against intermarriage between the tribes. Those are very temporary things.
where or uh, or to make us uh, to make the shemana mishka it's only made once what well, yeah the, all these things certain things have come and gone the Ramam is very clear about these things there's more in his introduction there but these commandments are eternal because apparently the torah gave it to us for an eternal lesson i think every generation has to learn this thing i don't think it was like the jewish people on a whole were weaned from this ever Yes, there was, you know, there, there, people came out of Egypt, so they were more used to demon sacri- demon worship, correct? So that's what they had to, it's explicit in Vayikra, apparently. So good question. Rambam, Rambam and Ramban both have who to rely on. Ramban relies on the beginning of Vayikra, and Rambam relies on the middle of Vayikra. So I, I haven't seen a, an answer between them. But I, I do believe that whatever Rambam was thinking, apparently we haven't gotten there yet, because the Torah still gave us these commandments. And the sages, uh, you know, it, it seems pretty clear that the sages felt that this is going to come back also, even if in, let's say, late Second Temple times, it was already, sacrifice was already being done less and less. And that could be someone's doctrine showing that in certain times, they offered a lot more sacrifice than they did. It was a second temple, it was a first temple problem. People thought, oh, bring a lot of sacrifice. It'll make, it'll, it'll expiate the sin. It'll make God happy. They weren't doing that in late Second Temple times. They weren't thinking, oh, just more sacrifice, it'll work. They had gotten beyond that point, thank God. But they still, the sacrifice is still part of our, our religion, yeah. What do you want to do with all these animals in the old city? I mean, you know, a poor gets Well, the old city, hold on. You want all the nuts to run down the road? We, we, were, dis- we were discussing this in Tisha B'Av. This, the, the prophet, Ori describes, open up the back of your, your Bible. The prophet Yechezkel says that there's going to have to be redoing all of Jerusalem. Jerusalem itself will have to not be a residential area. They'll, they'll need to make a lot of space around it. The temple complex will be much larger than it is nowadays and be surrounded by the area dedicated to the Levim and the Kohanim and the Mashiach himself, basically taking up a whole band of land going all the way to Gushtan. So it, we will have the capacity, just like we'll have to create all sorts of transportation hubs and all that. We have to clear out a lot of stuff. If you think we're just going to put the temple right now in, in the old city of Jerusalem the way it is now, then you're, you have a, you're, you need to start, you know, where we have to go back a little bit and clear some of those preconceived notions. And the olden days, yeah, there was a thing with, with animal supply and all that. There, there, we are going to have a major change in how things are done. And I guess the urban, or the, in this case, the sanctuarial planning of the city. But it will have to happen. Heck, you know why the white paper... What did the British say? What was their justification for stopping Jewish immigration to Palestine in the 1930s? Do you know? So just to know, what was the population of this country? By this country, I mean basically uh, this part of Palestine and Transjordanian Palestine. What did they say? They looked at the population, both Jewish and non-Jewish, and they said it's growing, and the land cannot provide for such a large population, and therefore, we have to stop all immigration to this country. 300,000 people is just too much. We're, we're pushing our resources here. It cannot be. You know that? They said this. These geniuses, and also anti-Semites, they said this. But there was some, they really thought this way. Of course, Ben-Gurion was telling them, no, it, it, you know, give us a chance. But the point was, they saw it and they said, oh, it technically can't be done. I don't believe someone who says that because there's all sorts of things that technically cannot be done in this country and all of them have been done. And not only that, there's so much more that we realize we could do. We could support much more population here. You know that. So I'm not, I certainly if the prophet said we will do it and it will be done, I'm pretty confident it will be done and we can do it. So read the end of the Sefer Yecheskel. He describes this. He doesn't mince any words. It's very clear. It's, it's, not like, it's like you're reading Sefer Yeshayahu and you need a dictionary to understand what every word means. It's written in very, I'd say it's written clearly in English. By English, I mean you can understand what it says. Okay? And that's what it does say. And we're going to do this. I hope that answers the question. Oh, no. Last, last point on this. It's okay. Um, it's your time. Is, is this uh, issue with the more of the law and practical the left in the temple? Is this like a stira that you get when you like combine the more and the Torah that, that you sometimes do get in Rambam? Or is this is it not a like perhaps intentional stira that I wanted to 
Okay, so you know what he's talking about now. The, the Rambam writing an introduction to the guide that he might contradict himself in order to throw people off the real trail of what he's trying to say that he wasn't, doesn't want to say explicitly. Okay? So I don't think that these contradictions are found in the Mishnah Torah. The Mishnah Torah is meant to be taken. It is a guidebook. The Rambam doesn't say about Mishnah Torah. And by the way, learn to read, learn to read between the lines. And if I contradict myself, try to remember the underlying rules and all that. That's not what the Mishnah Torah is. The Mishnah Torah is pshat. The Mishnah Torah is psakalacha. The Mishnah Torah is, as the Rambam says, you want to know how to rule and live your life according to the Talmud, all you need is my book. Of course, everybody after him has disagreed with that essential contention, but that was his intention. Okay? Contention and intention. There's a difference between there. The Mornavuchim is a lot more trying to get, you know, Mornavuchim is certainly not for public consumption. It's for college-level Rambamists to try to understand his philosophy behind what he was saying. But even in the Mishnah Torah, what does he do at the, sorry, in the Mor Nebuchim, what does he do at the end, end of Mor Nebuchim? He explains why he wrote what he wrote in the Mishnah Torah. So for all these cases, first follow what's in the Mishnah Torah as a matter of practice. For example, the Rabbim himself went to the temple and wrote to us, and, you know, I really want, I went there to pray, and I should be zochet to do all these things one day. And if he harbored some feelings about one day things will be different, and his own contradictions or his own deeper feelings about what should be, I'll leave that to, let's say, the professors to, to, to figure out. You could ask them. And I can't answer a question like that because I don't know enough about this. And unfortunately, just like the Rambam says, I don't want anybody explaining anybody the stuff that I'm only doing between the lines. I don't want anybody to be mefarious this and tell people what my true intentions were. And what do you get now, Robert? You go to the, to the store and you could buy a Mishnah Torah that does the exact, no, sorry, a guide that does the exact opposite and it actually tries to tell you what it, what the Rambam really meant. Over there, you have four different editions of the Mishnah Torah. You have the Rav Kapach version, and of course you have Rav Avinir's version and other people's, and then you have more academic Jews who have their interpretations and even non-Jewish interpretations of the of the Morin Avuchim, trying to do exactly what Rambam said not to do with his book, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, so... Let's not get into too much more Nebuchim, the deeper questions. It is clear, though, what the Rambam is trying to tell us to do. And if I think that if Rambam were here, and he had this opportunity more be asking us, why have you not even gotten started in trying to build the temple? At least build the temple. All these things Rambam talking about, intricacies of the sacrificial service, but the essential building of the temple, when no one denied, he'd say, first, you know, get going with that, the Kohanim. And perhaps these bigger questions, by the way, what does the Rambam also say? What's the ultimate Torah way of deciding what the Torah, what should be done for the people? Rambam says it. You have a you have a Beit Din, a Sunday dream. They have to decide what to do. And you might get outvoted. Yeah, there might be, I can imagine the, the Sanhedrin sits for the first time and they're going to say, should we uh, perhaps limit, we'll make a Sheval Tase, less, less animal sacrifice, only on certain occasions, only Passover and the Korban Tumbi, let's say. Like Rav Cook eventually found a justification for doing that. That would be a question, but then it would be put for a vote. And yes, 25 Rambamists would say, okay, we're in favor. And what is it? 20, 75 minus 25 is 46, I think. And 46 are, are not in favor. So that's it. It gets voted down. And next time, we'll have to come for a vote next time. That's what the Rambam says, the real halacha, what the Sanhedrin tells you. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Let's see one more halacha because we, of course, uh, we have to break a tent so the guys can, you know, get home. This is something we discussed on, on Monday. No one's allowed to sit in the Azara. Can you sit in the Harabayit? Yes. Are there chairs in Harabayit? Not really, but sometimes people just sat on the floor of Har- Harabayit. The only people that sit in the Azara are kings, Davidic kings. And we said, wait, did Moshe Rabbeinu come down with this rule saying only Malchei Beit David could sit in the Azara? How'd that work? Did this rule apply in, in Shiloh? There was an Azaran Shiloh. So I offered that. No, the, the, the legitimate leader gets to sit there. And eventually, David Amelech was the one who was chosen forever. So once he was chosen, he was no, no other place could be fit. What Ma Davardome, the site of the temple. It used to be the temple was where it was, wherever they set up the Mishkan or in Shiloh. God told him, put it in Shiloh. Temporary. For now, now this is the Azara. But one day it will be moved to some other place, and then the Kedusha will be there. So, too, this rule used to be applied to God's chosen uh, leader. So Moses could sit in the Azarah because he was God's chosen leader of the Jewish people at the time. And then that, that uh, privilege was given to Joshua. 
and whoever was the shofet at the time, Gidon, even though he didn't accept the kingship, had the privilege of sitting in the Azara of Mishkan Shilo back in the day until David Melech was chosen and his seed forever. And only because the, the temple could only be in Jerusalem now, that's just one place that was chosen forever. So too, the, the leadership, the kingship was put in the hands of this one family. And from now on, only someone who comes from that family could enjoy this privilege. That's the way I understand it. I think I haven't heard a, another explanation or because it, it apparently is a Torah rule, but it couldn't have been, uh, it couldn't have been formulated in this way when the Torah was given, just because it, you know history has a way of working in one direction. So uh, that's the salacha. The question we also dealt with on Monday was, wait a minute, you're not supposed to stand and eat. That's against Derech Eretz. But the halacha is that the priests eat their sacrificial portions where? In the Azara. All the, the sin offerings, the guilt offerings. So did the priests, were they standing while they're eating their sandwiches? Hold on one second. What's the answer? It's kind of what I haven't seen a, a, a I haven't seen a, 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 a answer to this. There's an illustration in the back of one of these books. It shows you the Kohanim sitting in like a room adjacent to the temple courtyard and eating the sacrificial food together. But if that's a sac- sanctified place, then they're not allowed to sit there. And if it's not sanctified, they're not allowed to eat there. What's the question, Josh? I feel like, I feel like I'm, you could have um, staying with the um that's the next thing the Rambam says the Sanhedrin they're sitting in the area that wasn't sanctified that doesn't count as the Azara no because they need to eat in the Azara the, 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 the Sanhedrin can gather outside the Azara they're just over the line so they're sitting just over the line. So what did the Kwanim do? I haven't seen a question about this. Rav uh, Makover, who wrote uh, all those nice encyclopedic books about what's going to be in the temple. So he deals with this question. There is no answer yet. I, we wait for a Sanhedrin. Yeah. It's just not that if it's from standing here, we have a mitzvah and not yeah. as a then it would be dead. But some stand. people take this thing really seriously, like the sages said that. Okay. I would think that, I, I don't think that the illustration, I lean toward that one. They would stand and eat. Also because I grew up, the thing you learn you know, when you're in America, what do you do at Kiddush and Shul? How many people stay, take the food and stand, stand at Kiddush? Who sits who's down at Kiddush? Because then it's a pseudo. Okay, so we grew up with that. In our culture, it's not such a bad thing. So we can we can understand this better. And then you learn, you go to Yeshiva, you read the Rambam, not just to stand while eating ever. And yeah, actually, you're not even supposed to sit in a chair. You're supposed to be leaning. You're supposed to be on a couch. So... However, we don't we don't understand it, so we lean we lean we have our biases towards certain positions, yeah. But hold on, positions, tarte mashma, yeah. There, that was talking about the lechem upon him on Shabbos, but we're going to see with regards to eating the sacrificial portions, they actually have to supplement what they're eating in order to make it a proper act of eating. They brought in bread and other vegetables to eat with it, uh, and condiments they talk about. Sometimes there wasn't enough meat to go around, so they added other stuff, just like at Korban Pesach. So you're only going to get a kazayas, so you eat other foods with it. You maybe bring a shlamim also, a chagiga, so that you have more meat to go with Korban Pesach. So that's basically where it has its parallel with the Kohanim. And that whole thing with just a little bit and satisfying them, dafka lechem upon him and dafka on Shabbos. Yeah, was there another question? No? Okay. I think I want yep. to go by the Rippon with the Christian Christian guys for the children to take Good. You know, because, you know, I, I like to pay I told the guy that it was paying for this. I said, if you, you hold like the Chazanish, so if I'm paying, you know, 18 shekels for a Kazayas, I want it to be like a Kazayas Zayas, not like, you know, one of your, all these Rambam books say, you know, the Rambam says a Kazayas is basically 3cc. That's basically what comes out from the Rambam. You find it also, even the Korean, they admit this. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather get an 18cc. You know, uh, and uh, one more thing. This is the next halacha thing that we discuss all the time. Even though the mikdash is still is in a state of destruction, it's still just as holy, and you have to revere it just as much. You learn from this that temple is temple, even if it's in the state of destruction, and temple is temple even if it's just the whole uh, the temple mount. And we've said that we can't uh, get over this. Mashmi rat shabbat leolam af mora mikdash leolam. Okay. It doesn't matter if the temple's in the state of destruction or not. 
we still have to respect it. We still have to revere it. We still have to keep all this, all of these halachot. We even offer sacrifice therein if we had the opportunity. Yeah, it doesn't take away from our responsibility to actually rebuild the temple the way it's supposed to be. But we have to do everything that is incumbent on us. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.